Hello, and welcome to New Economic Research. I'm here today with Professor Gérard Dumenil of the National Center for Scientific Research. Professor Dumenil, thank you very much for joining me. Thank um, you for inviting me. I would like to discuss this book, The Crisis of Neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. You were saying to me that the crisis of neoliberalism and the story of inequality are, in effect, the same story. I was wondering if you would care to elaborate about that. Yes. You know, actually, you know, the the, the inequalities began to rise in the United States and in other countries, in particular in the United States and the United Kingdom, much more than in France, okay? Uh, with the, the, the emergence of the new phase of capitalism that we call neoliberalism. And this occurred in, at the beginning of the 1980s or in the late 70s, but really with the 80s, okay? The um, very important moment in the U.S. and in the world was 79, when the central bank, the Federal Reserve, decided to increase <coughs> interest rates at a very high level. And this marked, in a sense, uh, the entrance into the new phase, which is neoliberalism. And simultaneously, uh, so in income inequalities and wealth inequality began to increase tremendously. And finally, you know, the development of neoliberalism led to the crisis which occurred in the late uh, two, after 2000, 2007, 2008. I'm, I'm very struck by the fact that uh, when we got to this crisis point in 2008, <clears throat> you would have thought that much of the uh, philosophic underpinnings of neoliberalism had been discredited, and yet it still seems to be very pervasive today, the philosophy and the policies that flow from them. Uh, you see this in Europe in particular, the embrace of the austerity philosophy. It's almost as if uh, 2008 didn't occur. Yes, but here you, may, you need to make a difference between uh, the United States and Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm speaking now mostly of continental Europe. Huh? Yeah. Uh, the United Kingdom will still be different too. And, uh, uh, of course, you know, the ideology, I would call it, you know, of neo neoliberalism in the U.S. is still there, in a sense. But there is something new, which is very strong policy, okay? Very strong macroeconomic policy in the sense of monetary policy, in the sense of huge deficit of the budget, okay? And uh, while supporting the economy, all that because it's linked to the experience of the Great Depression, of course, you know, because the action of the government was so strong. I mean, by the government, the government in the strict sense and the central bank. So, and many policy, you know, go, uh, with respect to the cost of uh, energy, to, to supporting, you know, key sector of the economics and so, in a sense, uh, in the United States, uh, the, the idea of laissez-faire, as we say, okay, it uh, vanished to a large extent because now the action of the government is very strong. And this allows <clears throat> the United States to, they are beginning to recover. It's not, it's not over, you know, we are not really out of crisis circumstances. It was very efficient. But in Europe, it's very different, you know, and just because in Europe you have a huge heterogeneity among countries like Germany and Greece, for example, it's not the same thing, of course, you know. So the situation is very different in Europe. And uh, well, uh, we have this policy that we call austerity and all that, sticking to all principles of balance, trying to balance budgets and so on. So <clears throat> it's not the same story on both sides of the Atlantic. Do you think uh, the United States, it's a, it's a, it's a genuine change of, uh, of philosophy? Because I say that as, as someone who lives in the U.S., uh, the, uh, the, the, the deficits were bemoaned. Uh, they were considered to be some sort of awful aberration. The mm -hmm. activist actions undertaken by the central bank. Uh, so, I mean, they, they, it seems that there's a, a large number of people that would like to go back to the status quo ante. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. But, you know, it's only one aspect. I spoke of policies. Yes. All of the, of the intervention of the government. So all the ideas of laissez-faire, the government should not interfere, <clears throat> and all that, you know, of course, all that changed with the crisis. If not, it would have been a complete catastrophe, mm -hmm. okay? So it was really necessary, but of course, you know, the other aspects of neoliberalism, which are basically the way of managing corporations, okay? And this is extremely important because in this book, for example, we show 
how suddenly in the United States and Europe, in particular in the United States, the way of managing corporation changed completely, you know, beginning in the 1980s. It's, it's, uh, you describe it very much, you know, what, what many people would call finance capitalism. In other words, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the corporation uh, is, is driven uh, or managed with a view towards enhancing uh, the, the, the share price, uh, rewarding uh, exactly. a CEO compensation. M maximizing uh, stock market indices, you know, this is really the target. And in the U.S., it goes extremely far, and it's still now we are still in the same situation because it's, of course, distributing dividend, but also, for example, in the U.S., we analyze that in this book and our new last new book, book in French is, uh, here. La okay. Grande uh, Bifurcation. Yes. Usually we publish in English, but here there is one exception. We publish in French. Well, we might once. get a translation for it at some point. Hopefully <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's on the agenda. <laughs> it, uh, I hope it will come. But here we analyze that in more details because this book is more recent. But in the US, for example, it's fascinating because within neoliberalism, it's the, the corporations are financing the stock market in the sense that they repurchase their own stock shares. Rather than invest in investing in productive investments. Oh, yes. Example. And uh, uh, instead, you know, normally, I would say, in capitalism, it would be the stock market which finance yes. the economy. But in the U.S. now is the reverse. The it tail is, wagging the dog. Okay, yes. because they are, they are really buying and buying in order to maintain the levels of uh, stock shares. So all that did not change. Also, you know, globalization. Globalization in the sense of free capital movement and, above all, financial globalization. Finan all that did not change. Now the world, you know, must not the entire world, because I'm not speaking of China or to a small extent, but, you know, is dominated and is controlled by a system of huge uh, financial corporation. Mm -hmm. Of, it's not only the U.S., of course, because you're going to find German, you know, French, you know, also uh, <clears throat> big financial institution. It's a network. It's a family. It's a family in the sense that they own one another. But all that is dominated by the uh, U.S. institution. The United Kingdom plays a role the city of, how you say, uh, belts, you know, of a transmi transmission belt, you yes. know, in this system. This, all that is still there. So in this sense, neoliberalism did not change. And also the rise of inequality, very high wages, okay? incredibly high wages in the United States for at the top, of course, because mm -hmm. the, the wages of the majority of the population are completely They've been stag stagnant for the stagnating. Last years. I'm yeah. speaking in purchasing power mm -hmm. since the 1970s. So all this feature of neoliberalism did not change. And that, that uh, is, uh, to, to clarify, that's not only the case in the US and the UK, but also continental Europe, you have the same problem. Yes, but you see, uh, we speak of neoliberal capitalism to describe the present situation. But uh, of course, you know, various uh, countries or continental Europe, England, the United States, it's a different situation. For example, you know, in France, yes, we are a neoliberal country in a sense, but much, much less and differently than the United States. In Germany, for example, you have two Germanies. Mm -hmm. It's very important. You have a, one Germany which is still uh, uh, some kind of industrial Germany inherited from the first post-World post -war, post War II decades. On the other hand, you have another financial uh, Germany, you know, which is completely neoliberal in a sense. But so, you see, in a, of course, it's always more complex, but the situation of various countries is also very different. It's but even, even in Germany, I would say that, uh, you know, you've got a, a country which uh, still believes in exports, uber alles, and it seems to me that they are beginning to embrace this race to the bottom in wages, even in places like Germany, because uh, you know, the, 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 when you place the primacy on your export sector and um, global competitiveness, uh, the, the party that seems to always lose out in that situation is labor. Yes, but you see, the policies of all the rights, including the French so socialist government... I was going to say, it's not just a, <laughs> le the, the, the left has been co-opted. Yeah, this as well. uh, the policies of uh, all the rights, uh, political rights, including the French government, including Germany and so on, have common features. And one common feature is diminishing the cost of labor, okay, in neoliberalism. And of course, this was the purpose of globalization, opening frontier with Asia, but also, you know, with uh, a country like, I don't know, Romania and Europe, or, you know, and so. So, 
placing you know, all workers in a situation of competition with the cost of labor in Eastern Europe, which cannot compare with the cost of labor in France or in Germany. All that are common aspects, okay? Specificity of Germany, balancing the budget, you know, mm -hmm. for historical reasons. It's very well known, you know, they believe it's extremely important to balance the, the budget. And, and Which, so is, of course, it's my, by accounting identity. It's much easier to do when you're running a huge current account surplus. Ex exactly. Yeah. If you, of course, you know, but still, you know, Germany has a, a debt. So the government has a big debt, you know, even uh, similar to the French debt, you know, and it's, uh, it's huge, okay? to 2,000 billion compared to 300 in Greece. But Greece is a small country, Germany is a big country. So and let, me, let me turn to France for a minute. It's an interesting situation. Of course, the metrics there are poor in the sense you have double-digit unemployment, um, but they're not uh, depression-like conditions in the same way that you have, let's say, in, in, in Spain or Greece. Uh, <coughs> even Italy seems to be deteriorating at a faster mm. rate right now mm. than France, and yet the Political reaction response to the economic crisis in France has been has manifested itself in a more extreme direction, and by that I mean you have a very very large component of people that are now supporting the Front National, the National Front. Uh, Marine Le Pen in the last yeah, yeah, election yeah, sure. uh, uh, got over twenty five percent of the vote, and she's considered a leading presidential candidate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think uh, is causing that, and why has there been no response from the left? Well, uh, you know, in France we have a socialist party, and this socialist party, uh, they would not say we are neoliberal, they would say we are in favor of globalization, because mm -hmm. globalization means modern world, okay? Mm -hmm. It would be to move towards the past, that too. So there was a very important transformation, you know, in, in this party. Now we also have a radical left, okay? But for some reason, which would be difficult to analyze, our radical left is rather weak. Okay, compare with Greece now, with his government. So they make, you know... Well, that started see, under Mitterrand, didn't it, really, when he, oh, yeah. when he brought uh, the communists of into course, the government and effectively course. strangled that, that portion of the, uh, the, the political spectrum. Exactly. The break was 1983, you know, when they decided to move in Europe to integrate the French industry and the French economy in the world of globalization and the new, uh, the new neoliberal world. Okay, the decision was made, so we cannot... While France, you know, had this idea of more public sector, in France we have a system of school, which has public school, and top managers will graduate from this public school, and mm -hmm. so on. So there was a path for France in the direction, in this type of direction. But finally, the choice was made, you know, to move into the new ne neoliberal world, and the transformation was rapid. Also, as I said before, you know, France is not the same type of economy as the U.S. economy. Similar in many respects, but also very important differences. And so now, <clears throat> we have a radical left, but this radical left, for some reason, is rather weak. You know, they don't make much in the election. They do not convince people. And, of course, in now, in France, like in Europe, you have the problem of the euro, okay? So comes... Now Marine Le Pen, who is very smart, you know, she speaks very well to the people, very clearly. And she's explicitly anti-euro. Oh, yeah, and see, she, but now it's a problem for her. We will maybe return to that. Mm -hmm. But you see, uh, what she did was policies of the radical right, okay? The central bank is going to finance the deficit, you know, measure like that. We will stop with globalization, free movements of capital. We will, we will tax financial transaction and all that. All the policy are the policy of the radical, the radical left. I was going to say that's an attractive package well, for a lot of people. And the second aspect was we go out of the euro because we are French, okay? We are French, so we go out of the euro. The radical left, you have half, maybe. Half of the radical left will be we go out of the euro, okay? What we call sovereign mentiste, sovereign, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of France, sovereignty of France. And But the other half is uh, more... In, uh, with some kind of international view, mm -hmm. internationalist view, even if international doesn't mean the entire world, but at least at least it means Europe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 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 Martin Le Pen, she moved in this direction. But if you read the, the, the newspaper about the recent election where she did rather well, you know, now it seems that actually she is meeting a, a, a kind of limit, you know, to progress. Because many people in the right are still in favor of Europe and the euro. 
So they don't want you know, to go, that France go out of the, of, the, of the euro. So this would be a political limit you know, to the progress of marine, marine it's, That's interesting because, of course, when the uh, Maastricht Treaty was, um, uh, they, they, to France's credit, they had mm. a referendum on it. Yeah. Uh, but the vote was very close, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Sorry. just barely over 50% in favor. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and yet you su suggest that there's still a viscerally strong uh, pro-euro sentiment. Yeah, the, but uh, you need to distinguish bet between, between uh, uh, building Europe and having the, uh, the euro and the Maastricht Treaty. Okay, it's not the same story. And when the vote occurred, people were not understanding very well wh what was in the Maastricht Treaty. For example, <clears throat> in the Maastricht logically, after building what we call the common market, which was opening frontier to trade within Europe, the next step in the building of New Europe should have been, I'm speaking of Europe in this narrow sense, you know, of what is the European Union now, the next step should have been financial unification of Europe, which means similarly to the free trade within the, the, with Europe, we should have had a financial Europe in the sense of no financial frontier to transaction within Europe. But the Maastricht Treaty do not say that, doesn't say that. The Maastricht Treaty says all free movements of capital around the world, okay? So, so there was never a real uh, financial Europe which would correspond to the common market, okay? We're, free opening, you know, free movements of capital in the world. And this was really the neoliberal aspect of the Maastricht Treaty. So uh, people had to vote. First, it was not very clear for everybody because it's complex. And second, you know, what should we vote? We are in favor of Europe, maybe a common money, uh, but, uh, well, uh, in the Maastricht Treaty, you have aspects which are against Europe, okay, which is opening all financial frontier was against the building of Europe. It means integration in the neoliberal world. So what could people vote, you know, in a situation like that? And, it's, and of course, uh, it's, it's, a very, it's very problematic for the common currency because, uh, as you pointed out, and other people such as uh, Anton Bender, uh, Bender and, and uh, Florence Pisani, they've, they've mentioned that you have such distinct banking systems in, in each of the uh, various countries that it, 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 it complicates this matter of, of uh, especially since there was no effort 30 years ago made to unify uh, the financial well, services, the financial structures. The uh, financial system in uh, Germany is very different from the French uh, financial system. But you, you also have to understand that dynamically because in the uh, 90s, late 90s and early 2000s, uh, there was a French government uh, tried to, to transform the completely the French financial system in the sense of creating big institutions to try to compete, to measure up or to big financial institutions around the world and in particular uh, and uh, uh, to compete with the US to have a seat you know, in the big financial family and this was a catastrophe. So all the financial system which had been inherited from the first decade after World War I uh, uh, like like Caisse d'Epargne, you know, and all mm -hmm. that, were transformed radically to correspond, you know, more strictly in their mind, you know, to, to, to the new functioning of financial institutions. And this was a catastrophe. Do you, th do you think the common currency itself is a product of neoliberalism? No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Very personally, I'm in favor of trying to maintain the euro, and uh, I'm in favor, you know, of the building of a strong... Europe in this sense, and politically, uh, uh, in, for the economy, culture, you know, and everything. And so, so I'm not at all against the euro. The problem is the policies, okay, the policy of the central bank, and so on. And uh, going out of the euro, now we have <laughs> Yanis Varoufakis here, okay, so, so the problem is going out of the euro. <laughs> it's very difficult because we cannot see the solution. There, there is no solution within the euro, no solution outside of the euro. Are you concerned so, that if uh, Greece were to exit the euro, that the, the whole uh, common currency project would come under threat? No, 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 no. You because, think that it can be No, in? because Greece is a small country, it's two pairs. Well, Lehman was a small investment bank and still... Yeah, 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 true, but you know, I think, I think Europe can stand it, okay? Europe can stand it. The problem will be for Greece itself because it's not a problem of going out, yes, going out of the euro, very good. But, you know, the uh, problem is default.
because if they go out of the euro, they will be completely unable to pay their debt. So you can think here, I travel a lot in Latin America, you can speak, think of Argentina and the 2001 crisis. So it's not only going out of the euro, devaluation, but defaulting on the debt. Because with a devalued currency, paying the debt would be complete. It's already impossible, you know, and uh, it would be even more impossible than, than within the euro. So what is the solution? I think you interviewed various <laughs> Yanis Varoufakis, and he told you the solution. But personally, you know, I'm not uh, uh, very confident, you know, in this type of... Unfortunately, the problem is a political problem. The problem is us, okay? We are the problem of Greece in the sense that, you know, in France, we don't have a strong radical movement, a left radical, a radical left movement. We don't have... Maybe in Spain, but it's not... Working. Not really well developed. So, Most of Europe, in fact, does not have a strong radical exactly. left movement. Uh, and the, the problem is uh, perfectly yeah. possible to solve the case of Greece within the euro, but the solution must come from the central bank, solution must come from other countries. And this will never happen now because, you know, there is no... It's not just electing a radical left government in Greece, okay? You need a, a radical movement within Europe. And so then they will have some motivation to change the situation because it will be politically dangerous. But the problem is that, yeah, Greece elected a radical government, but the problem is that there is not enough pressure coming from other countries for radical change. Why, why have, has there not, why, for example, has France not uh, shown common cause with the, with the Greek government? They, they seem to have been very much in, in Angela Merkel's camp. Yeah, yeah, but this is what the socialist party is about now, okay? Even, even the radical left, okay? He, he, now in France, of course, you know, they support uh, this type of uh, uh, the victory of the <laughs> of Syriza in Greece, you know? But not so strongly, okay? Not so strongly. There is no conviction, you know? There is no idea that we have to meet in, in Bruxelles, okay? It, really, this is the important thing. It doesn't mean to, to, to have power, but it, it means to necessarily to have power, but it means to be able to uh, exert some kind of very strong pressure on a European institution, and in particular the central bank. The central bank can solve the Greek problem in two months, okay? But they don't do it for political reasons. And, the, the, by, mm -hmm. and in, in what respect do you think? Just unconditionally guaranteeing their bonds, or for, for example? Okay, the, 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 the debt of Greece is 300 uh, billions, okay, uh, euros. The new program of the central bank is, during one year and a half, we're going to buy every month 60 billion securities, public and private securities, okay? So use this money during two months or three months to buy the security issued by the Greek government, okay? You solve the Greek, the debt of the, uh, the Greek problem. You certainly saw, you, you, yeah, you, you solve the, the and sovereignty or yeah, the, the solvency yeah, issue. Exactly. You know, but you know, this but means... You all, but there's also a problem of, of aggregate demand. I mean, there's two distinct problems as the issue of national solvency but uh, aligned to that is the problem that you have deficient aggregate demand across the okay. continent. But you see now in Greece, uh, yesterday we're sitting very interesting session on austerity, okay? But now in Greece, if you look at the, the deficit or surplus of the government, mm -hmm. now in Greece, if you set aside the, what they pay as interest, okay? They are running a primary for the budget exactly. surplus. They are pri running they a probably, primary. Given the scale of the unemployment that exists, there, they probably should be running a large deficit. In fact, yeah. most European governments should be running large deficits see, with the prevailing austerity philosophy. You, you need really to transform this situation. They need a deficit now. They need investment from foreign countries. But in, for example, you can compare with uh, Spain. Okay? Mm -hmm. Spain is a country in a terrible situation from the viewpoint of uh, unemployment and so on. But, you know, uh, countries, other European countries were also investing in Spain, and they had a, a very nice... Uh, uh, the industrial sector, you have, you have two components in the industrial sector, old-fashioned, but also very nice uh, industrial sector, new industrial sector. So during the crisis, this new industrial sector went on exporting. Okay, and this is what is missing in Greece. Okay, Greece they need a new uh, advanced sector of this kind with a cap 
uh, capability to export and so on. And of course, European uh, capital coming from other European countries will play a role. But now the situation is so bad that nobody is going to put his money in, in this country. Okay, I'd like to bring this back. We've discussed Greece for quite some time. I, I want to go back to the question of inequality. Given that neoliberalism is still very pervasive and given that many of the conditions that gave rise to the crisis are still in existence, how do we uh, mitigate the problem of inequality? Um, do, you, do you see anything on the horizon that would um, change that? Is there something that would alter this um, fundamental philosophy which seems antithetical towards promoting greater equity? First, I would like to say that uh, the problem of inequality is a problem of what we call of uh, the United States and the uh, United Kingdom, okay? You in think France, it's all, you don't think it's France, a problem in France? It's a problem, but in a different sense. Okay, here you have Piketty, okay? okay. And Piketty data that we already use in this book and uh, before, you know, we use the same data even, even before. So first thing I, must, I want to say <clears throat> is that people do not make the difference, but if you look at the data, According to Piketty's data, for example, there was no rise of income inequality in France at all. Okay? It's very important. There was no rise of income inequality in Germany. Income inequality is the United States and the United Kingdom. Huge rise of income inequality. This for political reasons. Now, there are also limitations in the data that we are using because in Piketty's households are divided between in terms of uh, income hierarchy between 0 and 90. And then he studied what happened within the 10% uh, up there, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so the group 0 and 90 is a very broad group. If you follow this type of data, uh, you have the situation I described, no rise of inequality in France, huge rise of inequality in the United States. But of course, in France, if we had good data to study the group between 0 and 10 percent, I mean at the bottom of the income hierarchy, sure, we would find rising inequalities because we have poor people, you know, and the situation is deteriorating. But in the type of data, you know, of which people spoke a lot uh, and that we are using in the book here, okay, the situation is typically U.S. and even. In the United States, in terms of purchasing power, seen the purchasing power of the group 090, just excluding the 10 person of, uh, at the top, okay, this purchasing power did not increase, you know, since the 1970s. This is an incredible situation, while the purchasing power of the 10 person increased, and when you move towards the top, you reach huge wages, huge flows of dividends and so on, and their purchasing power increased tremendously. So how does okay. one reverse that? How does one reverse that? Reverse you have to reverse neoliberalism. Okay? You are, it's, a, it's a completely new form of, of capitalism. What, what people don't uh, really see, you know, it is the importance of what we call managers. Mm -hmm. Well, I take manager of very broad sense, the sense of people in the public sector or people in the private sector. Okay. So actually, you know, in the rise of inequality in the United States, you have two components. The main component is high wages, really high wages. Of course, also high capital income, okay, in the sense mm -hmm. of dividends, rents are not so important, interest, and all that. And also, it's important to say that, of course, we don't really know the wealth or income of very rich people because of tax events. Mm -hmm. Piketty believed, uh, and... Uh, Zuckman, who now working with Piketty, believes that this is not so important, but I'm not sure this is mm -hmm. correct, okay? I believe this is still very important because a lot of money doesn't appear, you know, and they don't pay taxes on, on a lot of this money. So some progressive form of taxation would be one thing. Well, this idea, Piketty's idea, is entirely, you know, taxation. The global okay. wealth tax. Uh, taxation. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, well, of course, I'm not against that, but I don't believe in that at all. Okay, because yeah. you have an economy which is functioning according to rules that I rapidly described before in the sense of managing corporation with one target, the stock market, in the sense of this globalization, financial globalization, this network of <coughs> big financial institutions and so on, which are governing really the economy of the world. You know, we have studies which show that they are controlling maybe 90% of the profit in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. As long as we have this type of economy, it's not a problem. You don't, cannot conserve the system as it, as it is and begin to tax. The problem is how do you manage corporation? What kind of targets do you have? How you 
of everybody, at least I am in favor of globalization, of course, but globalization must be a gradual process. The problem with... with uh, it has Leo, to be more inclusive. It has to be... Yeah, it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, the fruits of it have to be shared more equitably. Yeah, the, the, the problem of neoliberalism is not the movement toward globalization. is to decide we just open everything. It's impossible to do that in one day. Okay, uh, it, It's not possible to do that with this kind of speed, at this kind of speed of degree. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have to move toward that, but we have to move gradually. So if you keep all the features of the contemporary economy, contemporary world, and here we would have to speak of China, because I'm studying mm -hmm. a lot, China, you know, many, many other countries, and not only the United States. Well, you see that I come, and now I tax rich people, okay, uh, on there. But, you know, this is not going to, you, you cannot change a system in this manner. No, it's a, it's a, it's a long-standing problem. It will take a yeah. while to, uh, to, to sort it out. Um, we have to end it here, but uh, Professor okay. Duanil, thank you very much for your time and your insights. Okay. They've been invaluable. And we hope to speak to you again. Thanks thank you. to you. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you.